Hi there, folks, and welcome back, uh, or welcome for the very first time to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again, and this podcast is brought to you, among others, by our sponsor, Hiroshi Shimizu. If you're thinking about moving to Japan for work, or to open a business, or if you're already in Japan on a temporary visa of some sort and you want to switch to a permanent one, or for any other business and visa-related inquiry, Shimizu-san is an immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener, and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and consultation related to these topics. He's already done exactly that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him on info at h-shimizu-office.com, or just pick up the phone, give him a call on 092 732 Double seven double five or plus eight one nine two seven three two double seven double five if you're out of Japan at the moment. Okay, so for today's episode, recently had the pleasure of having a nice long conversation with one of our oldest and biggest clients. They're a couple from Canberra, Australia, Nicole and Michael, or as their friends call them, Mick and Nick. And these guys have been with us from the very start. So we're talking close to a decade now. The savvy investors, obviously, super chill as well. They're Australians, after all, and they're a real delight to work with. And I asked them, or rather, I asked Michael if he'd agree to come on the show and talk to us about、um, their own personal investment journey, how they got into it, how it's worked out for them, and some of their life and investment philosophies. And he kindly agreed. So, without any further intros,、uh, here's my chat with Nick, one of NTI's first and biggest clients. Hope you'll enjoy this chat as much as I did, and I'll see you again on the other side. G'day, Mick. Thanks so much for joining us today. Awesome to have you on the show. G'day, Steve. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm getting warmer here, probably getting colder where you are, right? Oh, it's actually magnificent here in Canberra at the moment. It's like just gone autumn, and we've got blue sky days, just、like、a little breath of wind. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, low 20s. So it's kind of about as nice as it gets at any time of year in Canberra. Here at the moment, but it's just a hint of a、uh, hint of cold in the morning. So I'm getting getting itchy for the ski season to come up in front of us. I got to say, aside from uh, Tasmania, um, the coldest place I've experienced in Australia was probably Canberra. It does get pretty colder in the winter, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it felt pretty cold, but not. I mean, not, not that cold. Might, might get minus five or minus six overnight a couple of times a year. But、um, yeah, the day daytime temperatures, we're not. Yeah, it's, We don't get snow all that often. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's usually actually a lot of blue sky days、uh, all year round in Canberra. It's pretty dry climate, so you know, even in the middle of winter, you can still get quite a bit of sunlight to go out and, and have some fun. So it's not too bad. That's brilliant. Okay, so be- before we talk about anything else,、um, I gotta ask. That's been bugging me for、um, almost a decade now. <laughs> Um, you guys, you're Nick and Nick, right? Like, did, did you hook up because of your names? Like, did, did, did you like meet for the very first time and say, "Hi, I'm Mick. I'm Nick. Oh my God, match made in heaven," kind of thing? <laughs> not quite. Not quite. I actually, I did, I did realise that Nicole was my、uh, soulmate the second I saw her, which is、um, something. Yeah, for, it's a bit like a long time we've been together now, but yeah, it was one of those. You know, locked locked eyes at first sight, and that was that was the end of the story. But um, yeah, no, the the, the Nick and Mick thing is uh, it's given it's 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 made us pretty much an inseparable duo over the years because you know become an entity. Sometimes it's it's Nick and Mick as an entity rather than Nicole and Michael as separate people. So, <laughs> yeah, when 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 did you meet? When did you meet? Ah, nineteen ninety nine. Actually, is when we when we first met. Yeah, I was actually、um, I was、uh, sharing、uh, in a group house as a young kid、um, with some mates, and、uh, Nicole walked in the back door one time with a couple other mutual friends, and、um, yeah, very.、Uh, that was it. It was it was all over. We discovered pretty quickly that we had a deep love affair with all the same kinds of music, and that was that was it. We've been、uh, <laughs> inseparable ever since. That's brilliant. And, and career-wise, I think you've. You've walked pretty similar paths as well, as far as、uh, your jobs were concerned, right?、Uh, yes and no. Yeah, yeah we're、um, we're we're both in the IT industry,、um, so we've been you know, career IT、um, consultants.、Um, but the the job role, the you know the the skill sets and the niches we're in are actually incredibly different. So Nick's a Nick's a software developer, very、um, very. Very capable, very detailed, high level and high focused、um, logical thinking is is Nicole's 
um, special party trick. Uh, so she's, she's sort of been in that space of the business where I'm in the project management uh, side of the house. So I'm actually uh, much more facilitating trying to organise outcomes and arrange teams of people to, uh, you know, to make magic happen. People generally way smarter than I am. But, uh, I'm sort putting of, out fires. Yeah, putting out fire. yeah. <laughs> putting out fires, starting fires, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is distracting attention from fires, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so um, you've you've been in, in I mean, career-wise, you've been in relatively high-paying jobs, right? So you obviously managed to um, to budget, to save, um, and it, you know, if you're well placed financially to do this with a family um, at the tender age, of, can I ask how old you are this year? <laughs> yeah, I uh, I had to actually um, scratch my head and make sure I knew the answer to that question. Um, I'm 44 next week, so I've got a Got a birthday coming up, and uh, forty-four has, has jumped on me pretty quickly. But anyway, <laughs> so ten to young age is very kind of you to say. <laughs> oh, you're younger than me. You're spring chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, so um, and you you also had a bit of a career pivot recently. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we've um. Yeah, we we are working on a new venture. So yeah, as, as you know, we've uh, you know we've been for a number of years trying to uh, plot a path towards having you know more options than just just the day job. Um, so yeah, we've been we've been walking that journey for, for quite some time, and I think the the next thing is we're uh, uh, you know getting into a, a new industry for both of us. Um, you know, just trying to trying to finalise the the purchase of a live music venue at the moment here in Canberra. So. Um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been an interesting year, um, you know. Towards you know, trying to look at buying a, a, a hospitality based business in the middle of a pandemic has given us plenty of uh, problems to solve and, and opportunity for uh, looking at angles on things. But yeah, we're um, we're excited. Yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be a fun uh, and exciting new sort of part of our lives as we move forward. But we'll continue doing all the other things, all the other. Um, the business investment and all the other stuff that we've done along the side, because that's sort of you know how we how we structured things to to move forward. Okay, that, that, that was actually <laughs> going to be my next question. So, um, obviously, investing in real estate or other things um, it does help with establishing an income stream, right? That um, I don't like the word passive because it does take attention and fine tuning and work, but it is separate to, like you said, the day job, to whatever you happen to be doing aside from it. So you can focus on other things as well if you're well positioned there without having to scramble to make ends meet. So what does your investment portfolio look like? I mean, geographically, asset class wise, um, I'm obviously involved in the property side of things, but is it just property or do you have um, other building blocks in there too? Yeah, so we've, um, you know, as, as you said earlier, you know, Nick and I, we've been in a in a position uh, for quite a while. We're, we're in, um, you know, secure employment with, uh, you know, pretty attractive uh, wages. So, you know, we've we've always tried to make our surplus money work for us. Um, you know, luckily from quite an early age, I met a few people who kind of, you know, seem to have their stuff. Um, together financially and uh, ask a few questions of, of the right people and, you know, got me into looking at investment uh, in various asset classes, all kinds of different things. So, you know, um, stepping it back right to, you know, when we first started looking at um, investing in general, we just, you know, just sort of looked at the broad asset classes like property and, uh, and Australian property uh, and then things like, um, you know, uh, just direct shares, uh, ETF kind of instruments, um, all kinds of things. And, and over the years, we've we've had you know interest in all kinds of different asset classes. But I think that um, one of the reasons we when we started first getting into and got into investing is we we did have some good advice. One one fellow I asked um, again another another fellow IT consultant who had pretty flashy cars and. Plenty of properties around the plate, around the world, and, and options seemingly at his fingertips. I sort of said, you know, how are you doing, and, and what are you doing? How are you make? How are you making all this work? And uh, he was more than happy to help, but he did puzzle me a bit when he threw me a handful of books to read, and 
and I actually started reading them, and they were pretty much all mindset books. They were all about the why of investing, not not the how. Yep. Yeah, and that kind of puzzled me a bit. I'm like, yeah, you know, it wasn't the answer I was expecting, but as I, you know, I was expecting him to say, hey, I'm buying this kind of option, and you know, I'm trading in this commodities market, and I'm, you know, doing analysis. It was it was nothing like that. It was about, you know, really, why do you invest, and, and what is the, you know, what is the path to building wealth? And thankfully, he put me on that path because I think it it just gave me an appreciation that there's lots of different asset classes and they've all got different pros and cons and they go through cycles and, um, you know, all, all the strategy about just adding little building blocks to your portfolio, that's really kind of how what he got started as, you know, as investors right from the get-go. So um, in terms of the kind of things that we hold now, we're always kind of restructuring our portfolio, um, but properties one part of that, um, you know, I think any wealth building strategy should include an element of real estate um, and certainly having a real estate across multiple geographies, multiple currencies. You know, there's, there's pros and cons to all those things, obviously, but there is a lot of strength in having a diversified uh, holding to build your wealth. Um, so that's really where, you know, when we looked at you know, the property market here in Australia is quite different to the property market in Japan. Um, and they've got different um, different uh, pros and different cons. You know, certain things that work really well in some markets aren't features in others. So, um, you know, that's where really we've approached this in terms of having, you know, a whole, basically a spreadsheet <laughs> full of different assets of different types and, different, you know, and they all have different uh, risk and reward kind of elements to them if that makes sense so yeah it does make a lot of sense and um, I think a lot of the questions that you see especially from um, beginning investors is like what's better to invest in should I go for equities or should I go for real estate and uh, what should I buy if I'm buying real estate where should I buy and what should I buy if I'm buying equities what kind of companies to and that's really not the way to look at it, is it? I mean, there's no silver bullet that you should be investing in this and not in that, right? It's it's all about, about diversity and hedging and understanding the various vehicles and then um, constructing your portfolio so that it's got a bit of everything or at least a bit of everything that you're comfortable with, right? Absolutely. I mean, all, all these, there are countless options in how to invest your money and, you know, ultimately, they're all different, um, you know. Some things are tangible. You know, properties are properties are tangible. Um, real estate, commercial real estate, anything like that has something a physical item to it. Precious metals is something physical. A, a lot of this stuff, you know, is um, fairly abstracted. You know, so if you're talking about um, you know all the various financial instruments you can invest in, there are countless ways to do that. But ultimately, they all add up to a return on a on a spreadsheet somewhere, or you're counting in, in a database. Um, and so that for us, you know, you, you, you said some of the, the assets that you're comfortable with. I think that's really an important point because you, you do have countless options um, in what to invest in. But I think the personal choice is uh, important in terms of what you're actually, what appeals to you in terms of uh, holding a various asset. So, you know, for us, real estate has always been a decent uh portion of our portfolio because just the, it is such a strong asset class it's tangible you know there's there's all the things that go with uh, real estate uh, in every market around the world um it's i think it's something that yeah, i'm not certainly the first person to point this out i think real estate's important for a balanced portfolio but mm. um yeah sorry i'm probably starting to go around in circles there i do that sometimes yeah i think um <laughs> A lot of it is also, even geographically, right? Let's say you are investing in real estate. Geographically, you should be um, investing in places that you're comfortable with uh, mentality-wise and places that you, because even if you're doing it completely remotely, you might have to come and take care of stuff once in a while when, when things go south or when you're looking at new expansions. So it, it's got to be a place that you're comfortable visiting in person too. Okay, so I guess that, that probably brings me to Japan specifically is is the Japanese property portion of your portfolio, is that um, a more recent part that you've added to it? I mean, for us, you're one of our oldest clients. Uh, we've been together for almost a decade now, but that's not saying much. Um, how and when and, and why, I suppose, to, w did you decide that you want to expand to Japan specifically? Yeah, so I mean, 
So, I mean, the Japanese property wasn't one of the first things we picked up in our portfolio, but, um, you know, we certainly had some experience in, in real estate ownership here in Australia, and, and as you're well aware, the, the Australian uh, market characteristics are, are pretty different to what you actually have in Japan, but um, we, nonetheless, we'd had, had some good experiences in Australian real estate. Um, but So I think it was in the sort of maybe the year or so post uh, GFC, back in 2008, 2009 kind of time frame, again, being in IT contracting, you... you you work with some other people that also have uh, disposable income, and, and there was a decent amount of interest at the time in investing in the US market. So there was a lot of very high yield uh, property being marketed and sold. That uh, was post GFC, right? Yeah, right? Correct. Yeah. So there was, you know, there was some really what would what should probably alarm any investor. There was, there was some quite high, uh, you know, gross yields being. Um, marketed for, for some of these properties, sort of 60, 70, 80% yields. And of course, you know, being maybe young and inexperienced, that, that might look really attractive. Um, or it might look attractive if you know what you're looking at, but, you know, that's a different story. So we did start looking at that US market and I pretty quickly formed the opinion that it wasn't far beyond speculation and, and to, you know, to be fair, you can make good money off speculation if you, if you do it right. It really wasn't what I was looking for. What I was looking for was a stable rental return um, with relatively low, low risk. Uh, and I didn't feel that that um, was, was present you know, really for me, at least in, in the American market, certainly not being remote, not being able to um, really evaluate the neighbourhoods you were buying into. It just, for, for me, it was not comfortable. But by that stage, I'd already sort of sided on some of the strengths of investing in an overseas market um, would be worth taking this position somewhere, you know, in terms of, you know, currency uh, fluctuation and that kind of stuff. So um, that's where I, you know, on a forum I think I actually came across a post you'd made on, on, a, on a real estate investment forum um, just talking about the Japanese market and, and that got me clicking, clicking links and, and looking a bit more into it and, and that's, you know, how I, I came across your services um, and we sort of started to go, um, foray into the Japanese market. Were you familiar with Japan familiar? at the time? Um, I had been. We travelled to Japan, I think, twice um, at that stage. In fact, twice is still the number of times I've had the pleasure of being in Japan. I've been trying to get there for, for years now without any success. Um, but that's, a, that's another story. Uh, yeah, so we'd, we'd been... Um, to Japan, uh, for, we spent probably two or three weeks in Japan and, and really enjoyed our time there as, as visitors uh, immensely. Um, and to be honest, having been there, uh, that actually did create quite a degree of comfort in my uh, expectation of the, the experience of, of dealing with uh, Japanese people in general or as a stereotype, you know, um, the, the politeness and the reliability and the you know, trust, general trustworthiness that it's on display um, through our Japanese society was one of the factors that made it a bit less daunting for us to uh, to pull the trigger and actually put some money down in Japan. Okay, and then you made the choice of actually going through um, someone like us, like a, a one-stop shop or a single point of contact, as opposed to working directly with uh, brokers or property managers and so forth. Um, was that after you've done some research? I mean, how, how did you reach that decision? Uh, it's, to be honest, it was never actually a decision for me because, you know, having, having, managed pro having, having owned properties here in Australia, I'm already of the view that, um, you know, unless, you, unless you've got a very small portfolio, trying to manage every aspect of um, being a landlord um, is not, <laughs> not necessarily an effective use of your time or money. Um, so we, you know, we've always used professional agents to represent, uh, you know, our, our property management here in Australia. Uh, so it was already given that you know, we would be doing something like that if we entered into uh, property in Japan. Um, the, the further complication there is, uh, obviously, there is there is no effective way that we could manage things directly in Japan, just because we we are. Uh, bilingual, <laughs> you know, I barely speak English, let alone uh, being able to communicate effectively in Japanese. No, um, the Japanese so bilingual. <laughs> bilingual. Sorry, Ziv. 
I'm saying nor the uh, Japanese bilingual. That's really the main issue, isn't it? Oh well, well, yes. I mean, yeah, yes and no. I mean, I, I think it's um, you know, it, it, well, I would love to. I'd love to speak a dozen languages, but um, having grown up in Australia, language isn't really a huge part of our, our, our general schooling. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, for us again, that that extra layer of, of complication, the you know requirement for translation services and understanding the nuance of, uh, of Japanese um, life. Uh, it, w it was always a given for us that we would we would uh, need somebody to to manage our affairs in this in this space, um, which is you know again why we um, in the right from the start we uh, when we reached out and made our first contacts you know we were fairly tentative to begin with I guess in terms of just making sure that um, we understood the risks um, and that we had had trust that you, know, you and your company uh, could effectively handle um, our affairs in Japan for us. Sorry. Mm. And um, well, that, that was again, that was almost a decade ago now. And at the time, we were just starting out. So, you are our most rapidly expanding client, which I, I obviously we appreciated as a, as a fledgling business. Um, and I mean, I mean, you've since lost that title, but you were our biggest client, um, both in asset count and capital wise. And it did take a good few years for you to lose that title, but you're definitely, I gotta say, still one of our favorites. And this is the, kind of a recurring trend for us um, and maybe um, for other portfolio managers as well. Our biggest clients also seem to be the most laid back and fun to work <laughs> with, right? And, and by that, I mean, you seem to be a lot more aware uh, than most, uh, especially most smaller clients of just the ups and downs that come with investment of any kind and property is no different, right? You, you need to calm, calmly evaluate situations and potential solutions um, level-headedly. And maybe it's just an experience thing, uh, I'm not sure, but um, w we have got lovely chilled out clients who only want, you know, own one or two smallish properties too. Um, most of them in fact have been uh, really great and we really enjoy working with them. But if we do get someone who does stress easily whenever there's a vacancy or a maintenance request, for instance, or somebody who just, you know, refuses to accept that things are done in a certain way here as opposed to um, how they're, they might be done back home where they're from. And we talk about this a lot on the podcast too. These clients always tend to be the smaller ones or the less experienced ones. Um, any, any idea why this is? Is that something that comes with experience or is it a, a frame of mind kind of thing? Yeah, that's in, it's a very interesting observation. Um, look, I, I think there's there's probably a few elements to all that. So you know, I think part of it is who um, you know, it's personality based on, and who I am, and and Nick being part of this uh, as well. You know, it's who, it's who we are. So you know, I've um, I'm pretty laid back in general, right? So I you know I do take things very seriously, but at the same time, I'm very much a believer that you can. You, you can impact some things, and you, and some things are beyond your control. And I, I try not to burn too much energy on worrying about things that I can't control or things that you wish were different, because it doesn't really get you very far. Um, I think you know again, it's, this is understanding the asset that you choose to invest in. You know, there, there are some. Uh, you know, I'll pick up on something you said earlier. You know, a, a real estate based income stream is not a passive income stream. <laughs> You know, there's it may be a lot of overhead income stream, but there's definitely a lot of things that have to be done when what you're ultimately selling to, to your end customer is you know, a physical space somewhere. So you know, there's, there's always going to be a water tap. You know, a tap will leak and will need to be repaired, or you know, the you know some fitting will will go bust, and you know, every time that happens, it's going to cost you some money. So. Um, you know, if you only have one or two doors, perhaps, and, you know, you've only got a modest income stream coming from your portfolio, then, you know, if the, you know, let's say an air conditioner dies and maybe, maybe you're up for, I don't know, 100,000 yen or whatever, the, whatever it is, um, you know, that, that's going to sting, right? Because it's, you know, you might not be making that much income off that, just that one small door, um, and you, you suddenly got a big chunk out of your yearly take. So, you know, that kind of hurts, I guess, if you look at it like that. But, you know, when you start multiplying your portfolio and you, you end up with, you know, 
any number of properties in, in your portfolio, then let's say if you've got 50 of them, you know that every year a certain number of things are going to break and go bust. You're going to have a certain amount of overhead for plumbing and, and electricals and, you know, sometimes you'll have a tenant that'll leave and you'll find that the, you know, the place really needs a good uh, overhaul to get it ready for the next um, next tenant. Um, and, and, you know, there's really not many options that you have there other than to to fix the problem and move on. So, you know, realistically, that's where I've always valued um, working with you, with you and NTIs is because you are very, um, you know, very responsive in terms of letting us know where there are any maintenance issues, for example, and you're also, you know, pretty conscious that all these different repairs do add up. So, you know, I've always had confidence that if... Um, you know, when an issue was reported, that if there is a cheaper solution to fix it, you know, if it really just needs somebody out there with a spanner rather than um, replacing your whole boiler, um, then you guys have, have every confidence that you're managing that angle of, of the investment. So, you know, when things do go do a break or you lose a tenant because they've moved out, you know, it's going to cause an interruption to, to your income for a period of time and you may have some expenses, but... Um, that's where having diversity in your portfolio is really important because if you, again, if, if you've got one or two doors and you, you end up having a vacancy, then that really hurts your income stream. But if you've got 50 units, uh, and then you should expect that a couple of them are going to be vacant at any one point in time. Um, but it's, overall, it's not going to you know, interrupt the overall performance of, of that part of your portfolio. So it's really a, a, kind of a case of a long-term view, isn't it? I mean, you're looking at the entirety of your portfolio rather than individual issues. And like you said, also, um, there are certain things that are just beyond your control, um, like 2020, for example, right? <laughs> that, that is actually a good example. I mean, weathering storms, right? How did you do this year? Did you suffer any damages investment-wise, career-wise? Um, did you capitalize on any opportunities? How did um, this very unpredictable year go for you? Yeah, it's, a, it's certainly unprecedented, isn't it? It's, um, for, for us personally, we're in a very um, fortunate space here, I think in Australia in general and in Canberra where we're based. We've Certainly, there's been a lot of um, interruption to normal everyday life. A, a lot of, you know, I'm sure you've seen lockdowns in, and borders getting shut at a moment's notice and, you know, a lot of uncertainty across a lot of sectors in, in Australia. Um, but, you know, having said all, all that, you know, our personal situation, we, we've been quite fortunate because we have we have work that, um, you know, we can complete remotely. You know, I've, I've worked from home at least in some capacity for probably the last five years as, as yeah, as a, as a normal way of doing my business. So um, certainly the, you know, the disruption to the, the working from the office kind of thing, you know, wasn't something that um, has really impacted us that heavily. Um, you know, like a lot of us, I guess, this is a certain uncertainty is really hard to know how to move forward investment-wise and what to put your money into when something some so um, monumental as, as this pandemic, you know, it's really quite a, a difficult decision, I guess, for, for any of us to, to try and predict the future and what's going to be a, a safe investment or a responsible investment. Um, but I kind of look at it again, coming back to the what's in your control and what's not. Um, you, you know, people are still going to need somewhere to live, right? No matter, no matter what happens, people always need to eat and you know people will want to move and um and travel and all those kind of things so you know for me you know, it's, it's a long-term thing it's like overall yes there's, there's a massive disruption to uh, the world's economies right now and i've got no idea how that will play out in terms of you know, balance between national economies and currency valuations and you know uh, massive multinational corporate structures i can't control any of that so I try not to, um, you know, we just try to make the decision that, uh, you know, makes the most sense uh, based on the overall context. You know, we, you, if, you, if you're looking for absolute certainty out of investment, then there's not many things that will offer you that, um, that comfort, you know, even 
precious metals and uh, cash, you know, that all those assets, they've got some pretty serious um, risks and limitations with them too. So, you know, in terms of investing and what we look at um, during this period in time, you know, I spoke earlier, you know, we're actually looking at a business venture. So for us, that's, um, you yeah, know, that's where we'll probably be, that's where we'll be putting a good deal of our focus um, for the next couple of years just to, you know, to make sure that that, Again, it's not a passive investment. It's something that's, that needs some kind of uh, ownership and, and direction. Um, that'll be where we'll probably focus for the near term. But going forward, um, things like um, holding property in Japan, you know, for us, it's been such a uh, it's been such a stable investment, and it has really performed very well over the years. Um, there's absolutely no reason why we won't continue to. To hold assets in, you know, in in Japan and uh, and in you know Australian real estate shares, all those kind of things. Because again, the stock, yes, it's uncertain at the moment, but stock market's not going anywhere, is it? Mm. So, and diversity that we've mentioned um, a couple of times now that that's key as well, especially for these kinds of times, right? I mean. As we grow the portfolios, we always have to take into account those different baskets that we put our eggs into, and 2020 has been a perfect example of that. So I know that um, you recently, um, because of a because of the mix of um, um, purchasing or buying or or investing in a new business, and also the fact that some of your properties have been getting older here in Japan, and some of those. Um, are going to be um, racking up more maintenance fees or are going to be lose values as they get older. So you've um, liquidated uh, part of that portfolio and that's, that's enabled you to then invest or to, to pounce on an opportunity that you saw um, back in Australia. So keeping that concept of diversity and, and hedging in mind, how, how are you planning to move forward, um, have you changed your portfolio structure? Are you focusing on the same thing? Um, anything more adventurous, exciting? I don't know. Startup industries, uh, any new countries? What, what's on your plate for the coming years? Yeah, so uh, very good question. So there's, um, you know, I'm a big believer in diversity. As it sounds, you are, but I also, you know, I also have some. Faith in another, con- you know, another position that sort of sounds a little bit contrary to that, which, which is, you know, it's, I, I like to be diversified, but I also don't want to have fingers in fifty different pies. Um, you know, I think there's there's an effective, I think there's there's some strength to identifying uh, a number the number of things that you can actually understand and, and be good at, um, and really keeping your focus to that. Um, so, you know, what do I mean by that? Like, so all these different investments that you can get into, you, you can obviously buy real estate and, and, and think that that's one class, but actually there's, you know, there's so many specialist markets in real estate um, that really you can't be an expert in every market and you can't be an expert in every every town, every country. So, um, yeah, so as I was saying, you know, diversity is really important and we do want to have... a a diverse holding within our uh, wealth building portfolio because I think that's important for a bunch of reasons. But I think there's also an effective limit for us of how many different kinds of things we want to be holding at any one point in time. Um, and so if you look at Japanese property, for example, you know, we actually understand that market reasonably well and we've got excellent advocacy in that market through yourself and NTI uh, to actually allow that investment uh, portfolio, that part of our portfolio to be well managed, well controlled, uh, and it's a stable and well performing part of our portfolio. Um, as you mentioned, we've gone through. You know, we have sold off some. Of, we've liquidated some of the assets uh, that we've got in Japan. But realistically, for us, that is much more of a restructuring exercise than anything else. Um, as you said, we have an opportunity here in Australia. And one thing I've been really quite um, pleased with is how easy it actually is to sell. Um, property in Japan you know, if you've priced uh, appropriately for the market point. So there's obviously, um, you know, every different asset class has, you know, liquidity is something that's really important um, to consider and, and property is not especially liquid. Um, but we've found, you know, going through this exercise here where we're restructuring a good um, 
component of the portfolio. It's actually been quite pleasing how you know how effective it's been to actually secure sales on on these properties and move them. Uh, another thing that has pleasantly surprised us is you know when we first invested in Japan, we expected zero growth. There was there was no. Um, no expectation of growth really fed into our decision making process where it was really about the rental yield and you know ideally if we were able to maintain um, you know, the value of, of the assets then you know we would be pretty happy with that and in general um, most of our properties have, have uh, either held their value initial value or they've actually appreciated uh, in, in more than you know in quite a few of the cases there so um, for us, that's been really helpful to have um, not only a long-term income stream to, to rely on, but then to just know that you can you can move out of that position if you want to. And, and you know, for us, again, this will be a restructuring. Moving on some of those older properties um, was probably a good idea anyway in terms of just maintenance of, you know, the overall health of, of what we have on the, on the books. Um, so, yeah, and again... Uh, amazing assistance, you know, from from yourself and your team. Uh, it's no, uh, none of this stuff happens without some effort and some, you know. There's a lot of, I'm sure, there's hundreds of steps that go into um, buying or selling any of these properties. But you know, working through yourself, um, you make that very straightforward. From you know, my perspective, sitting here in Australia. Um, so yeah, thank, thank you to yourself and the team for um, such excellent support, and you know, making this a really quite a smooth exercise. It's been a, it's been it's a pleasure, been a <laughs> and it will uh, remain a pleasure moving forward, I'm sure. And I'm I'm honestly really looking forward to just catching up. Like you said, you've only been here twice, and I think both of those times. Um, were either before we actually were working together or maybe you were just in a different part of the country one of these times. So looking forward to catching up for a few beers, hopefully in Canberra with a live music show in your new venue once the uh, skies open up again. Yeah, no, I can't wait. It's, um, yeah, we were both, uh, both the times we were in Japan were before we'd actually started doing business together, Ziv. So I've, um, I actually threatened to try and plan trips there like five or six times, and for whatever reason, um, it's, it's eluded me. You know, the, this uh, we were going to take the kids uh, over there in September was the plan, and of course, with uh, travel restrictions, that's sort of unholded until further notice. But um, we're certainly, you know, we're, we're really excited to um, come back to Japan, and it'd be yeah, it'd be great to great to catch up and. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just a captivating place, and every time we get there, it's uh, it's an experience from start to finish. So, how are you going living there? You know, I know it's been when we first started working together. I think you were just in um, in the transition from living in, in Australia to, to back to Japan. How how are you finding it all these years later? Um, I'm loving it. I suppose um, I'm loving it more as long as I can get out once or twice a year. Like it's a fantastic place to live in, um, but it is like you mentioned, it is very um, structured. Uh, so I do occasionally need um, need a getaway. So whether it's um, Israel, where I'm originally from, or Australia, where I've lived for many years, or Thailand, where I like to go. I mean, I always choose places that are probably as far away from the. Uh, <laughs> structured and uh, rules-oriented uh, environment here. But as long as I can do that, uh, and it's been tough <laughs> the past year or so, as long as I can do that, it's a, it's a fantastic place to live. It's just um, everything is smooth and hassle-free and, like you said, you know, polite and, and well-organized, and it's, um, it's a pleasure. It has downsides, obviously, like any place, but of the places I've lived in um, to date, um, I don't see myself um, choosing any other place anytime soon. It's a good place to be in. Okay, well, perfect. Uh, Look, we've, we've taken enough of your time. So thank you again. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. And thank you for sharing your experience and your thoughts with our listeners. I'm sure they're better for it. Well, thanks very much for the offer to be part of the Civ. And thanks, uh, thanks very much for all the, the great support. It's, uh, it's been really valuable. Um, having worked with you has been, you know, it's given Nick, uh, Nicole and I so many options um, to work with. And, uh, you know, really can't thank you enough just for being such a safe set of hands. 
and uh, and supporting us in, in all our endeavors. So thank you very much, mate. Thank you, and uh, again, it's um, you're really one of our favorite clients. So thank you for being so um, <laughs> laid back and professional. It's a pleasure to work with you as well. So there you have it, Mick from Canberra. Actually, Mick and Nick, you haven't heard her, but she's awesome too. One of our favorite uh, client couples and really just um, some of our favorite people. You could probably feel the chilled vibes yourselves from the call. They're a real pleasure to work with. So if their journey sounds similar to yours or to what you've got in mind when you think about your investment portfolio in the future, or if you're already familiar with Japan and you're curious about what it's like to invest here, we are always happy to talk shop, as you probably already know if you're a regular listener. Don't be shy, drop us a line and we'll book a day and time and do just that. You don't actually have to be on the podcast to talk to us, so no worries if you want to keep it private. And if you're feeling more like just tuning in to a more public conversation or listening in on a Q&A session, uh, so just a quick reminder that we've got our Wednesday Clubhouse Japan Real Estate Room as well. That's every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Japan Standard Time. If you're already a member of Clubhouse, just look me up, Ziv Nakajima again, there's only one of me. Click on follow and you'll then get a reminder when the room's about to kick off every week. And if you're still not on Clubhouse, but you want an invite, uh, it's still invite only as far as I'm aware, drop me a line and I'll sort you out with one. And if you want to make sure that you have a beautiful profile photo to go along with your Clubhouse profile or any of your other social media profiles, or if you just need some high quality snaps of your upcoming event, a personal one, business seminar, or whatever else, um, and you're based in Tokyo, be sure to get in touch with our sponsor, Alex Watanabe of snaps.talk. He provides really, really excellent um, and affordable photography and videography services uh, starting at only 3,000 Japanese yen. That's less than $30. So you can check out his work on this episode show notes, of course. We'll link to his profiles, his email address, and the gallery of photos that he's done for us uh, at our last face-to-face -face business seminar way back there in 2019. Um, so don't be shy. Get in touch with Alex Watanabe on snaps.talk. That's T O K at gmail.com or via his Instagram account, Tokyo Night Owl. So he's your man for all of your Tokyo photography and videography needs. And if you've got a business or project that you'd like to promote to English speakers who are either based in Japan or have some affiliation with Japan, which is pretty much all of our listeners, we don't know exactly how many of them are out there, but we do know that we're now very close to 20,000 actually full episode downloads of streams every year. So don't be shy reach out and ask us about our sponsorship programs. They're a lot cheaper than you might think and we'll get you in front of all of these people or rather into the ears of all of these people. So that's it from us for today, folks. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do leave us a note in the comment section. Let us know how you liked it or if there are any particular topics that you'd like us to discuss in future episodes. And of course, we'd really love it if you could rate us or leave us a short review on the iTunes store. We're also on Spotify or any other platform where good podcasts can be found. Or you can just Google Japan Real Estate Podcast and go straight to our um, host, to Podigy. We hope to have you with us again next time as well. And until then, from all of us here at Nippon Tradings International, or NTI for short, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku.